What kind of ice cream is best? Chocolate, coffee. Chocolate, coffee. Moose trap. Moose tra well, okay. Uh, all right, spaghetti. Yes, no, whatever. All right, okay, so yes, I heard a lot of flavors. Now, here's a maybe more important question. What brand of ice cream is best? Bluebell something, okay. H-E-B, I didn't even make it. Brahms is my favorite. That is actually what this is right here. I love Brahms ice cream. It's like nostalgic for me. I had it all growing up as a kid. Brahms chocolate is my personal favorite. I, I don't know. I'm really plain. Okay, but anyways, I love uh, just some chocolate ice cream. So there's something that happens on a very regular basis in my house, and that is um, my daughter, Emery, will be sitting at the table eating a bowl of ice cream, and my son, Kyler, will be sitting across the table watching her eat it, and he will say, I want some. He still doesn't really have a voice. Okay, he says, I want some. And I'll say, no. But Emery has some. Eat your chicken. <sighs> and then he'll sit there and watch her. And then his little five-year-old amnesia brain or whatever it is happens, and he goes, I want some. <laughs> like, it's like, we just did this. It's like, no, you can't have it. But Emery has some. I was like, she ate her chicken. You didn't eat your chicken. Eat your chicken and you can have some. And he just, uh, and he says, so almost most of the time, he just doesn't get any. He gets to watch Emery eat the ice cream while he gets none. And I was thinking about this because have you ever just like looked at maybe some other people or maybe you've experienced, I don't know, and, and thought, it seems like, okay, it's going to be a big twist. Like, some people get a lot from God, and some people have very little or nothing. Like, have you ever seen, like, okay, like, they seem to, you as two people, and they'll both go through a battle or a storm or a struggle, and one of them gets peace, ah, and the other God gave nothing. They're so all stressed out and a mess. Or, or you look at somebody like, well, they always overcome their sin. Like, God helped them, but me, I just do the same thing over and over and over. Okay, do you ever, maybe you feel that? Um, feel like somebody else like got something special from God and then there's other people it seems like they're they're empty they're getting nothing from God and well I tell you what I've been doing this for a long time and I see a lot of stuff um, I know just from experience okay I could come over to this section right here hello cool y'all y'all look nice okay I come over here and I can tell you something okay in like two years half of you won't be in church anymore not just this church, you won't be in church at all if you go according to the normal, okay? Like, you just won't be around. Um, and uh, if I come over here, you know, you all look nice too, okay? And, and I was just thinking, you know, like, um, so you all have very different experiences. You see, some of you are going to do really great things for God. Now, I'm not speaking prophetically. Some of you will not do anything for God, okay, unless something changes, okay? I'm not saying that that has to be that way, but just if you go by normal, a few of you will do something great and the rest of you, lame, okay? And then if I come over and I need a row, uh, y'all, there's only two, but okay, here's three. One, two, three, okay. When they graduate high school, by the time they graduate college, two of you will not be a Christian anymore, one, two, three. Which two? Who's going to go to hell? I'm just kidding. No, like two of you won't even know Jesus anymore. That's statistics. That, I mean, maybe you guys will be different. I believe it. Okay? But just normal. Okay, now why is that? Why is it that we got three Christians in the same room and, and they're going to graduate, go to college, and one of them is going to really get something. That it's like, and the others, it's empty. Here's something I, I know. Okay? I want my son to, eat, to get ice cream. Because I like watching him be happy. It's fun. He smears it all over his face, and it's hilarious, okay? He is like, I, I want him to have the ice cream. Um, and here's something I know about God. He wants good things for you. He wants a full life for you. He, okay, he says it's an abundant life. He wants, he wants purpose for you. He does not want you to go through your life and live a pointless, meaningless, worthless life, which some of you will live if you don't get it, your act together. You know what I'm saying? He does not want that. He wants you to have a full life. He wants you to overcome your sin. I, did not, I got ice cream on it. Now I'm going to be covering ice cream the rest of the night. Um, he wants you to be full. He, okay, and so why is it and how is it that some of us seem to really get something different from God than others? Uh, now, maybe I can't answer every reason why some of you will fall away when you go to college tonight. Definitely cannot do that. Okay, I can't answer all that. But I think we can start in a direction that some of you and some of us, many of us, really need. Okay? So, are you interested in re actually receiving something real from God in your life? Anybody? Yes. Okay. 
you're the only ones getting it. All right. <laughs> no, okay, I think we all, all kind of want that, okay? So what we're going to do, we're going to look like way back, way back in like Numbers and Deuteronomy. Like that's in the beginning of the Bible. We're going to look at a, some story and how it applies to you and me. And uh, so um, there are some people in the Bible you may have heard of. Some of you won't, so I'm going to give you the back story. Um, but there's these people called the Israelites, okay? These were... God's chosen people, okay? And so basically, there's a guy named Abraham. He was faithful to God, and God said, I'm going to bless everybody through you. You're going to have all these descendants. So he had kids, and their kids had kids, and their kids had kids, had kids, kids, and kids. Until there was like 100,000, there's like a million of them. There's like tons of people from this one family tree, okay? And they're like spread out over. So there's like, this is God's people coming all the way from Abraham. I call them Israelites. We won't get into one. But they were God's chosen people who he chose to do things in this world through, okay? And then there was something they called the promised land, okay? Now, the promised land, simply, it was the place of blessing. This is where God has said, you guys are going to live here, and it's going to be good. Like, it, it's a land flowing with milk and honey, right? It's like, it's just a beautiful place. It's going to be great blessings in your life. So, there's God's chosen people, and he has a land for them to live in. However, there's a problem, okay? Some of you don't know this, so I'll tell you. They were slaves, so there's hundreds of thousands, of them, and they're in this place called Egypt. We still have an Egypt today. There was an Egypt back then. And so Egypt is where they were slaves, okay? And um, they, this means that they got up in the morning, and someone got a whip and said, you work or I'm going to beat you. And then when you're done, I'll tell you when you're done. You're not done when I, you're done. I'm done when you, tell, when you know what I'm saying? And they did what other people told them. They had no freedom. They were slaves. But they were God's chosen people and supposed to be in a promised land. There's a problem. Well, finally, a guy named Moses comes along. Maybe you've heard of Moses. Kind of important. Okay, <laughs> Moses comes along, and he's like, hey, let my people go. I'm not going to go through the whole story. They get free, and then they travel through this desert, and they get to the edge of the promised land. I didn't, I didn't think about the fact there's going to be ice cream here. But anyways, they're the edge of the promised land. And here it is. There's like a little river, and all they got to do is go across, and they're in the land. So they're getting ready. Finally, they're going to be in the blessing place, right? Well, they're going to be smart about it. They send in some spies, okay? think James Bond. Okay, probably not. But anyway, so they send in 12 spies, 12 spies, and they go into the land, and they go in and they say, man, there's amazing food, and it's amazing land, and it's awesome. And then they come back, and like, guys, there's all this great stuff, but the people are huge. Their armies are huge. Their gun, no, their swords are huge. Like, they're going to kill us. In fact, they even say, we are, they didn't say guns. That was, okay. Um, we are like grasshoppers in their sight. And what do you do if a grasshopper attacks you? Okay, you squish it, it's dead. And he's like, they are going to squish us. And they're like, there is no way. So 10 of the spies look at all these hundreds of thousands of people and they're like, we're going to die if we go in there. And they all listen and they say, we're not going to go in there. And this does not make God very happy, okay? So they listened to the 10 guys that said that they can't do it. And so I want to show you what God said to them afterwards. He said, because they have not followed me wholeheartedly, not one of the men, not one, one of the men, 20 years old or more, who came out of Egypt will see the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, okay, you guys. Everybody 20 years and older, it's not, you would have been all right because you're like under there. But he's saying all the adults, okay, um, all the adults who made this decision to not follow me, all of you are going to wonder, basically, they wandered in the desert for 40 years until they all died. And then the next generation got to go. They didn't get to go because... They weren't faithful. Okay, now, I want to I show you something. Now, these, these are, this is history, and that's neat, but I never liked history class, okay? And history is neat, but here's what you need to understand. These are images also of our, our life with God. So, I mean, let me just go back one. Israelites are God's chosen people. If you have put your faith in Christ, you are his chosen people. He has chosen you, okay? And so if, you are, if your faith is in Christ, you are God's chosen people. And you have a promised land. No, we're not moving to Israel, okay? And not, not a literal land, but there are promises that he has for you, like promises of peace, promises you can overcome sin, promises, okay? There are promises of blessing that he has for you, just like them. But just like them, a lot of Christians wander in the desert and don't ever actually experience the blessings that we have. And this is where some of you are. This is why your life feels empty even though you're a Christian. You're supposed to be better. I gave my life to Jesus. Well, you're in the desert, okay? And you got to get out of the desert. And so the, um, he says to them, hey, you're not going to see the land I promised. And there's some of you, you're not seeing the things that God says he will do. And there's a reason for that. But there was a couple people that did. 
Because he says no one's going to except, okay? He says not one except Caleb, son of hard name and hard name, and Joseph, or sorry, Joshua, son of none. I can say that one, all right. Um, for they followed the Lord wholeheartedly. So out of all of those people, there were two guys who said, we can do it. God said we could do it. We'll do it. And those two were the ones that went in. It took 40 years. They had to wait for everybody else to die. But by the way, when they went in, they didn't lose any of their strength or anything. They were still, God kept them strong. Okay, but so they, um, they followed the Lord. Here it is, wholeheartedly. There was something different about the way they did. So point number one, if you need to do this, point number one, you need to write this down. Oh, well, there's not very many pins. All right, point number one, write this down. It's this, okay? Many try to follow God half-heartedly. Many try to follow God half-heartedly. Do you know what? Okay, you've done stuff half-heartedly before. Because your mom said, go clean your room. And you went, <sighs> And you went in your room. If you did like I did, I would take all the stuff on the floor and just kick it into the closet, okay, or under the bed. And then I would shove the door closed no matter how hard it was and be like it's clean and then my mom would walk into my room open the closet and go clean your closet I'm like man okay and about half-heartedly I didn't want to do it. it okay you can imagine too you would not want to have a half-hearted teammate if you're on any sport at all I mean, you imagine, here you are, you're in like a relay race, and you run as hard as you can. You get done with your, your leg of the race, and you are about to pass out. You are in the lead, and you hand it off to your teammate. And they're like, hee hee, la 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 la. And you're like, what are you doing? You, like, you need to run, okay? You need to, okay, you don't want a half-hearted teammate, because you can't win that way, okay? And this is what I say. Many people, they try to follow God half-heartedly, and I just want you to know, you can't really follow God that way. Because what's going to happen is you're going to come up against a problem, a struggle, a difficulty. And as soon as you do, you walk away. And you don't really follow him. Because following him is going to sometimes be difficult and half-hearted people don't continue through difficult things. And so you can't follow God half-heartedly. That's uh, point one A. Here's point one B. You can follow God wholeheartedly. Now, you know what it means to do something wholehearted, I hope. I hope you've done something in your life with all of your effort. Otherwise, you haven't done anything good at all. Um, so ha- you know what it means to be wholehearted. And you can certainly imagine the importance of it in things, right? Okay, think about this. What if I said, I am just going to be half-hearted in my relationship with my wife? You know, I- I'll love her as long as it's convenient, I'll, I'll be faithful as long as I don't find anybody really attractive. Okay, that would be terrible. You're like, you are a, oh, she, she needs to punch you or something. I don't know, like, that doesn't work. You have to be wholehearted in your relationships. You can't half-hearted do things. You've got to wholehearted. Now, here's the thing. You have to wholehearted, go wholeheartedly after your relationship for God. I mean, some of you can't even sit through a service and pay attention for 10 minutes. And you're thinking, oh, and you can't, what are you talking about? Going wholeheartedly after God. And we're like, we play these little games or we just sort of play church. I'm going to tell you, you will never experience the goodness of God if that's the way you're going to go after Jesus. Because it's going to be way too hard for you. But it's, I mean, come on, isn't it worse to wander in the desert? That, that's the alternative. We got two. You can wander in the desert or you can go try and find some other way to live. And I can tell you, neither one of them will satisfy you. Like someone that will live wholeheartedly after, after God. So we're going to skip now. So they got there. Uh, we're not going to go in. They wander in the desert for 40 years. They all die. Now they come back again. Everybody's dead except for Joshua, Caleb, and Moses. And Moses is about to die. And uh, so they're all dead except for them. And they're ready to go into the promised land. And Moses is going to give them a motivational speech. And he's a terrible motivational speaker. Okay. And uh, so he's trying to convince them to go into the promised land. And this is what he says. He says, hear, O Israel. You are now about to cross the Jordan and go in. This is going into the promised land. And dispossess nations, here's where he falls apart. Dispossess nations greater and stronger than you. I was like, you are wimps, okay? With large cities that have walls up to the sky. Are are y'all getting motivated? Like, he's like, these people are better than you and stronger than you and you can't do this, okay? And then he keeps going and he says, the people are strong and tall. (laughs) Anakites. Now, Anakites means nothing to you, okay? This would make fear in their heart. This is like Mufasa, okay? Like, <laughs> if you're a hyena, like, you remember that's like Mufasa, ooh, okay, you know what I'm talking about? So, for them, it would have been like Anakites, 
Ooh, okay, just say Anakites with me. Anakites. Ooh, okay, yeah, they're freaking out. They're like, no, the Anakites. Okay, and it's not, it's not a good situation because they are strong and tall. Okay, this would make them afraid. And then they go on and he says, you, you know about them and you've heard it said, who can stand up against the Anakites? They're like, yeah, I have heard that. Like, apparently, this was such a thing, it became a saying. Like, you probably had sayings. Like, your dad definitely had sayings, okay? Your dad says something like, were you raised in a barn? Anybody heard that one? Or, yeah, does money, do you think money grows on trees? Anybody hear that? And then you were like, well, actually, money is made of paper and it grows on trees. And then your dad said, then go out there and pick it off the tree and <laughs> stop asking me for money, okay? And because this is these sayings, you know, whenever we meet someone that was like a little dumb, we'd always say something like, well, there are a few fries short of a Happy Meal. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, you got your little, your little sayings, okay? They had sayings. So their saying was this, who can stand up against Amalekites? In other words, here's something is difficult. I feel like I can't possibly do it. It's impossible. Well, who can stand up against Amalekites? Why can't you pass calculus? Well, who can stand up against Amalekites? It's impossible. Like, I can't do it. And so this was the thing. And I was trying to think about, like, how would this even get started? Like, at some point, somebody had to say it first, you know? It was like the first thing. And it probably happened like this. They had just not gone into the promised land, and they're running around the desert, and some kid's like, didn't God say we're supposed to be in the promised land? Why aren't we in the promised land? And somebody looks at that kid and goes, well, who can stand up against Amalekites? Anakites? I keep adding an Amla. I don't know why I'm saying that. That's doomed. Anakites. Anakites. Okay. I don't know. Anyways. <laughs> Who could stand up against Anakites? And then people just kept repeating it and kept repeating it until it became a thing. And here they are. He's like, you mean you've heard this. Who can stand up against Anakites? So here's point number two. Write this one down. All right. You will face Anakites. Not literal guys that are tall. Okay. Okay. But you're going to have struggles, you're going to have trials, you're going to have temptations, you're going to have persecution, you're going to have addictions, you're going to have bad days. There's going to be all kinds of different things that come against you that you will face. You, especially if you're trying to get into the things that God has for you, there's going to be stuff that comes against you. Okay? And then this is the question he asks okay, when you're gonna, about these things that you're going to face. I mean, who can stand up against them? Who can, who can stand up against persecution? I mean, who can, who can, in today's culture, be bold and be a Christian in public in a school? I mean, when you know that, if you let people know that you really believe that they're going to call you a bigot, they're going to call you a something phobe and another phobe, okay? They're going to call you, or oh, you're a Christian, boo. Okay, I mean, okay, you can go to church as long as you don't really believe that stuff. Can, you, can anybody really be a Christian in that situation? Can anybody really be pure in today's culture? Like when literally every, if you have a cell phone, you carry around access to pornography everywhere you go. Can anyone, can, can anyone stand up against that kind of temptation? Can anyone like not have a filthy mouth? I mean, is that even possible? Have you listened to the music? Have you been on TikTok and had that stuff all day long? Like, can anyone stand up in today's culture? Who can? I mean, who can stand up in that stuff? This is, this is the question. I mean, who can stand up against that? Who can actually live for God in today's culture? And I want you to know this. You can. You can overcome. You may not think that you can. You may not have overcome before. But when it comes to these things, look, you may have a temptation that you're struggling with, and you may feel like it's not going to happen. You may be like, well, who can stand up to this? You can. You may have um, a struggle Right now, in your life, it's like, I mean, who, can, who can have peace in the middle of this? I'll tell you who. You can. You may be addicted to something right now, and you feel like, who can get over this? Like, how? I can't. I'll tell you what, you, you can. And here, you can. You can overcome these things. This is what Paul said about it. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Like, who's going to keep us from doing the things God has? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword or anakites? I mean, whatever. Okay. Like, who's going to keep us from, from these things? And he says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. He says, you can conquer these things. And this is why. Because of him. Because of Christ. Because of what he's going to do in your life. And so we, as we think about this and you realize that when you're going to have these things, these struggles, these persecutions, these temptations, these trials, you can overcome. So let me ask you a question. Who can? You can. Who can? Now you say it. You can. I'm going to ask you again. Who can? Who can? You can. Now I want you to say, I can. Who can? I can. You can. I can. Now, you, you need to believe that. i tell you what. As long as you believe that you can't, you never will. And you can. 
Who can? You can. <laughs> I can. So, I believe that some of you need to overcome some stuff. Okay, so he says this. He says, who can stand up against the Anakites? Anakites. Luckily, he's not done. I don't know why I want to say Amla. I just thought. <laughs> Okay, Anna. Okay, Anakites. Now, he's not done. He keeps going. Now he's going to hopefully be a little more encouraging. He says, but be assured today that the Lord your God is the one who goes across ahead of you like a devouring fire. Now, I'm starting to like this one, okay? He will destroy them. Stupid Anakites. He will subdue them before you and you will drive them out and annihilate them quickly as the Lord has promised you. I'm like, I was reading it. I was like, God's going to do it. God's going to do it. And he goes, and you will drive him out. And I was like, these people are probably like, uh, Moses, um, see, you were saying that God was going to do it. And now you're saying we are going to drive him out. Because uh, me driving him out sounds like me gets a shield and me gets a sword. And I go up to Mr. Anakite, and he's this tall, and I have to drive him out. I kind of like the you being a fire thing more than me being a driver, okay? Because I don't want to have to. And here's the same problem we had before, okay? So am I driving them out, or are you subduing them? Which one is it, God? And here's what you need to see. It's both. And here's, here's I want to show it to you like this, okay? This is point number three, last point. You can live in God's promise. For them, there was a land, there was a place for them to go, a literal place that they could live in. And for you, there is things that God has for you to accomplish, things for you to do, a relationship with him to have that you can live in when you wholeheartedly submit to his process. That there are things he's going to ask you to do. He says, you're going to go in and you're going to drive them out. And if they weren't willing to go in and drive them out, I'm going to tell you where they would be, back in the desert, roaming around, dying until a new generation came up and said, you know what, we're going to be the ones to drive them out. Now, on their own, they would have gone in and the Anakites would have been like, you puny people, <laughs> okay, and killed them. But they had God there as well. But there was a both of them working together. And there's going to be a process. I can give you an example. You probably want to have peace in your life. Most people struggle with stress, and you need peace. Did you know that there is a process to peace in the Bible? Part of it, Philippians chapter 4 will give you the process to peace. Part of it is prayer and thanksgiving. That's part of what the process is. Here's another part. I'll just show you one example, okay? He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. He starts out, hey, here's part of the process. If you want peace, you gotta think, you gotta be careful with what you think. You can't just think anything and have peace. And then he keeps going and he finally says, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Uh, I thought God was always with me. He is, but you're not always gonna have his peace. Because he says, you've got to put some stuff into practice. If your idea is, well, I just kind of want to do whatever I want to do and ignore what God tells me to do, and then him make me happy. He's going, no. <laughs> you're not going to experience this if you're not going to go through the process. If you're not going to move forward and do the things that I asked you to do. Now, I'm not saying that you be perfect. If you had to be perfect, you don't get nothing because none of us are going to be perfect. Trust me, the Israelites were a mess, okay? Like they never hardly got anything right. And God still brought them into blessings. But, and, and you don't have to be perfect either. But that, that's very different than saying, I'm, I'm not going through the process. I'm not pursuing the things that God tells me to do. I'm not growing in him and getting better. So I kept thinking about this question and it just stuck with me. And it was this stupid, this silly Anakite thing, Okay. Who can stand up against Anakites? Do you know what it means to stand up to someone, like stand up to a bully? When my dad was in high school, okay, he told me this story. Um, there was this guy, this big, big guy. He was, they were standing in line for lunch, and he, would start, he started at the back of the line, and he, started, he would walk up and go to someone and say, give me, your money, give me some money. And people would look for the smallest thing they had, like a quarter, a nickel, Here, here's some money. And he would go to the next guy, give me some money. Give me some money. And everybody just gave him money. And my dad's watching this happen. My dad was small like me, okay? <laughs> and uh, this guy comes up and he said, I decided in my mind I'm not going to give him any money. And the guy comes up and he says, give me some money. And he said, no. And he said, I'm going to pound you. And my dad said he just made a fist. And he said, no. And the guy looked at him and he walked away. 
and he didn't ask anybody else for money. It took one person to say no. And he said, I was, you know, if you punch me, you punch me, but I wasn't giving him any money. <laughs> and I will tell you what, I'm wondering if there's anybody that's willing to stand up for God in their life, even if you get punched. Like, look, I know that it's a hard time to be a Christian. But so many people that do this kind of half Christian thing, it's not really even Christianity or Roman in the desert. We're not meant to be in the desert, empty life, not really doing what God has. Is anybody willing to stand up? If every one of your friends said, you're an idiot if you're a Christian, would you still be a Christian? If you were the only one that you knew that wanted to follow Christ, would you continue? If it meant that you had to give up something in your life, if you had to give up a relationship or a sport or something like that, I'm not saying God's saying that, but if he said to you, quit that, would you be like, "Hmm, back to the desert? Is anybody willing to stand up and wholeheartedly go after God? And what I wanted to do was end the message like this. I wanted to be like, so right now, I'm going to ask you to stand up if you are ready to go all after God. Okay, and I've been in that church, in that service many times, okay, growing up. If you're ready to go all after God, I want you to stand up. And I tell you what happens every single time, because I've been in a lot of church services. I'm old, okay. What will happen is, is I'll say, one, two, three. And like five people will stand up that are like, I'm ready to go all in with God because I realize I need to make a change and I realize that there's something better than what I have right now and I'm tired of this kind of life and I'm ready. And those five people will really stand up and they really make a change. And then the people next to them go, well, they stood up and then they'll stand up, okay? And then like, oh, they kind of stand up and stand up. And then there's a few people that are like, well, I don't want to be the only one sitting. I'm going to stand up, okay? And then, and then the whole room said, yes, everyone's giving their life to God. And I'll tell you, five actually did. Okay, so I'm not going to have you stand up like that, okay? Because <laughs> I think that's goofy. I don't want you doing something because somebody else does. Instead, I want you to make a decision to yourself. So, would you just do this with me? Would you close your eyes? This is not about anybody else's decision but yours. But I want to know if there's anybody who's wholeheartedly ready to go after God. So this is the way I want to encourage you to make that change because it is a change for most of us to realize we're just being kind of sort of after God to go full after him in a second I'm going to ask you those of you who say I'm ready to be all after God to raise your hand and no one is looking and so this is you and God you raise your hand because you're saying God this is me and I want to do that then after that, I'm just going to be, try to tell you, I'm going to ask you to go and pray with somebody or find a place and pray by yourself and talk to God and say, God, I'm ready to change. Not just a little emotional thought I had, but I'm going to actually commit to God and have a time of prayer with him to make a change in my heart to say, I'm not going to play games with Jesus anymore. I'm going to live fully after him and I don't want to be different. I, I mean, I don't want to be the same anymore. I want to be different when I leave this place. So if something in your heart has stirred and has said, look, you're not really doing this thing and it's time to be fully after God. If you're willing to stand up and follow him no matter what, I want to ask you to just lift your hand right now and say, that's me. You can put your hands down. I'm going to say a prayer over all of you. And I really believe that some of you right now are making a a heart change. And I'm telling you, you can see a difference in your life when that happens. It's going to change you. And I'm going to believe that he's going to do something in you right now. When I say amen, we're all going to stand. And um, I want to encourage you to do one of two things. To seal this commitment in your heart. One is you can pray with somebody. There will be people besides the room to pray with you. What I like to do when I want to just commit something to the Lord is find a place and just kneel before the Lord and just talk to him. Just you and him and pray these steps up here are a great place to do that you can kneel and just talk to the Lord but as we have an altar time and worship just take that as a chance to commit to him I'm going to pray Father I thank you for everyone that says I'm ready to stand up for you I'm ready to live wholeheartedly for you I pray that you would stir something in their spirit that is not the same again Lord I pray when they're facing an obstacle when they're facing a trial an anachite in their life Lord that they would say this thing can no longer hold me back but I'm going to take it out Lord I pray for courage and through persecution I pray for strength through trials I pray for victory over addictions I pray 
for freedom from sin. And I thank you, Lord, that you are changing us to be a different people and a different, uh, live a different life. I pray for, uh, for purpose and vision and hope in them. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.